this and hope that is today. Uh, hopefully you all spent out enjoying it, getting up the ski hill. Um, and, uh, when, and thanks to the Science Center for inviting me to talk the Tuesday Science Series. And when Marissa asked if I had anything on glaciers to present, I was really excited because uh, it's somewhat related to the melty end of glaciers. But it's a story that I've been looking forward to sharing with you guys for a while now. And so I, I uh, jumped all over the opportunity to come, but and then I was feeling a little guilty because there's nothing but ice worms or <laughs> further up the glaciers. A couple of years ago, my wife Chantel and I gave a talk on ice worms, and um, but I thought I'd give you guys some some updates on the highlights. I did a Google Scholar search of literature review, and there's been three articles published in the last three years, so it's a really uh, a vibrant field of study with ice worms, but uh, it just, you know, there's no funding for the ice worm, unfortunately. Um, they're fascinating creatures, though. Um, Kate McLaughlin at our front desk put together a little display that's in the post office area there. If you haven't checked it out yet, um, take a look on your walk out of here. It's really fun. She's got some great little humor in there. Um, and uh, yeah, this is actually an ice worm. Some artistic license had to be taken for the festival. That's um, actually an ice worm, too. <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, to make it a little more charismatic looking, but um, this uh, unassuming black worm is, is really very fascinating. Uh, for example, uh, they have a unique bacterial assemblage in their gut that's unique to ice worms in general, and then it's glacier specific. So these, in case you're out there swabbing the RNA of bacteria off of ice worms, you've been scooped. These guys did it. And they found that on one glacier to another, um, that there was different bacterial assemblages in the guts of ice worms, and that there were bacteria they didn't find anywhere else on Earth. So, a unique symbiosis there. Um, this next study, laying 2018, you know, ice worms obviously live in a, in a cold environment up there on the glacier, and so they have a unique way to metabolize energy. Their mitochondria function differently than other annelids. And they're actually studying this to see if they can learn more about how the mitochondria work and perhaps apply it to treating human diseases related to mitochondrial function. So uh, I thought that one was pretty neat. And then finally, just last year, um, these guys did a study of a genomic study on Vancouver Island and on glaciers here in Alaska. I think the Hubbard Ice Field and uh, maybe one other, Byron Glacier, I think was the second. And they found that uh, birds were a likely vector for moving these suckers around, picking up ice worms flying from Vancouver Island to Alaska, for example. <laughs> and that's how ice worms perhaps were transported across the North Pacific Rim. It's an interesting challenge if you look like this to expand your range from Oregon all the way to Alaska. So, so pretty cool. All right, um, back to uh, the main topic here. I uh, wanted to share a project that we're doing on Bering River, which is, hi, come on in, that's all right. We're just, just getting started. Uh, I won't back up to the ice one bit. Um, we have been collecting stream flow data at Bering River uh, for, uh, since about 2012 now. And along the way, we have encountered all sorts of problems, mostly associated with these mega floods, these glacier lake outburst flood relief. And, um, and so we've learned a lot. Uh, we've mostly completed our projects. I'm going to share that with you. And then we've, I've learned a ton about the Bering River country. And I think even for some of the folks in the room that have been here a long time, I'm hoping that I'll uh, teach you something about the unique geography of Bering River. And then um, certainly these, uh, these mega floods, these outburst flood events are occurring um, regularly now. And uh, we've been working with the US Geological Survey to better understand those. So I'll describe those events. Um, as always, um, I'm up here presenting, but there's a lot of other folks who worked on this project. So Will Schreck is here with us, and he's been doing a lot of the field work the last couple of years. Uh, the folks who've been around for a little bit probably know uh, Dana Kunch, who was our uh, staff officer here, and she's the one who got this project going, along with Allison Bidlack from Ecotrust. Um, they uh, got funding for the project and both promptly skipped town and it fell on my lap, so here we are. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm gonna start out though describing just in-stream flow reservations and water rights in general, kind of a 101. Um, and that was the impetus behind this work, was we were collecting stream flow data to apply for in-stream water reservations. Uh, then I'll talk about Bering River, our data itself, and then finally close with the outburst flood events. Um, this is a photo of the confluence of the Gandal River 
with the Bering River coming in from the left, and all those black dots that you see out there are the heads of seals, harbor seals. There were about probably 80 of them up in there feeding on salmon on this particular day. Who owns the water in a river here? Now, the state owns the water, but they give the rights to use to businesses, individuals, whoever has a beneficial use. Generally, that's extracting water from a river or from the ground to put in a well, or if you are gonna extract uh, water to run a hay field. You know, it seems silly here in Cordova, but elsewhere in the state and uh, in other Western states, this, of course, is a very common occurrence, and the state administers those water reservations. Fairly unique in Alaska, only about less than 1% of the water is allocated for use. So we are in a very fortunate scenario of having abundant water resources here, very different than uh, in the lower 48 in the western states. Uh, we, our state law is also unique in some ways in that it allows for reservations of water to stay in the river. So you can reserve water to stay in the stream and that's a for certain beneficial uses. And those include protecting fish and wildlife, navigation, recreation. If you have a river that you love rafting down, you can get an in-stream use to make sure you have enough water to go rafting. Um, or water quality. You know, if you have a city that's sucking water out of a certain river, you can ensure that the flows are adequate because as they say, dilution is a solution to water pollution. So you need to have a certain flow you know, for water quality in a lot of cases. And so this is a, a rather unused form of the state law is to reserve water to keep it in the stream. And um, part of this is just because we don't have the water issues yet that they have down south. And uh, the Alaska Department of Natural Resources administers the water reservations and the water right permits for that matter. They have a website with a very beautiful header. I'm really impressed with that one. And, um, <laughs> and it's a glacier theme too. And uh, they, in their website and kind of their basic info about water reservations, they have this up there. This is from the state directly. Why should I, you the public user, apply for a reservation of water, and it says you should apply if you want to ensure that there's a stream flow available for you and the public to do a specific in-stream activity or you know, if you want the water there. So if you want water in the stream for fish, you should apply for a water right, according to DNR, help protect that right. Um, the trick is you need um, at least five years, typically, of really high quality stream flow data to support your application. So again, these aren't inherent rights of an in-stream flow reservation. You need to apply, send in your $1,500 check, and you need to demonstrate how much water is coming downstream and how much the minimum need is to support your reservation. So the minimum need to support fisheries or the minimum need for your rafting. Um, so the burden of proof is on you to fill out the application and it's all based on flow data. Um, and water data is pretty sparse in Alaska. We don't have as many U.S. Geological Survey gauging sites as they have down south. The density is, of course, way less because we're in such a remote country and we have so much water to, to monitor and to study. Um, so, um, so that's what we've been working on here on the bearing is collecting this, getting our um, 175,000 data points. And why are we doing this at Bering River? Well, it's a uh, very productive habitat for Pacific salmon. Helps support uh, our local salmon fisheries in the Bering District there. Um, it's also really amazing country. And it has a fairly special mandate for management. So in ANILCA Section 501B, Congress has said that the lands at Bering River shall be managed primarily for the fish conservation of fish and wildlife in their habitat. So they've told the Forest Service, you'll manage these lands for fish and for wildlife. And so it seems to us that, uh, that maintaining a minimum in-stream flow to support fish habitat fits really nicely with that instruction from Congress. It would be hard to do our mission otherwise. Um, also, the way that water reservations work is that they're first in time, first in right. So currently there's no water use out in the Bering Country. Um, but if we get a minimum in-stream flow for fisheries, then that will be the senior water right. And so if there are other uses down the pike for 50 years, 100 years, however long you want to go out into the future, our right will be senior for that in-stream minimum flow needed for fisheries. Um, and so I think there's a level of transparency. You know, this is our mission as a federal agency. 
uh, we can work within the state's law and the state system um, to reserve a minimum flow uh, where we can help meet our mission and work in the state system um, and help provide for that public need for fisheries all in one shot. So that's kind of the impetus behind the project. Um, and um, here's a photo of a locomotive. It's right on the banks of Bering River from early 1900s. You know, there used to be train tracks from Catella. This is a map from 1915, from Catella upriver towards Carbon Mountain. Um, in 1915, by the way, Anchorage was, had been incorporated one year earlier. You look at this key here, you see this is a telegraph office. That's what they had in Anchorage in 1915, was a telegraph office. No commercial railroad, no commercial radio station. Um, Palmer didn't even make the map for a telegraph. Wasilla isn't on there at all. You have other towns like Catella that have come and gone. Um, so it's, it can be difficult, I think, to imagine how land use patterns can change in the time scale of 50 or 100 years or how resource demands can change. And so we see this as an opportunity um, to help meet this mission and get these data now um, while we still can. So where is the Bering River? Well, so you see Cordova in the upper left here, about 50 miles east-southeast, on the other side of Copper, <laughs> on the edge of the Bering Glacier, which is the largest ice sheet in North America. Um, and it's a super dynamic place. Uh, I think a great example of this are the changes after the 1964 earthquake. Uh, this yellow polygon, the biggest polygon here on this map, was the outline of Bering Lake in 1948. And it was tidally maintained at that point in time. We still have a little bit of tidal push all the way up into this confluence here, which is about you know, 10 miles in from saltwater. Um, and there was a lot more tidal push before the earthquake, you know, the uplift drained this area. Um, and so the lake was four times the size that it is today. You know what the uplift was over there? It was just six feet, right? I, I think it might have been slightly, in that range, or slightly less. Yeah, it might have been um, you know, a meter to two meters, no more. It wasn't huge like Montague Island or anything. Right, and Mount Bering Lake is shallow anyway. Turn yes, down. yes, so it's filling in, mm -hmm. and part of my impetus to make this figure was curious how fast. But you can see since 81, it's been holding reasonably steady, and some of this could be, the imagery could be taken at different water levels, but, um, but it's very broad and shallow. And a part of that shallowness is uh, related to, likely to this infestation of the Elodia, an invasive plant that grows in big mats there. And so when you're trying, it feels shallow when you're trying to cross it with an outboard, let me tell you, because you're bogging down into weeds all the time, you gotta clean it off. We fly into Bering Lake and then put together a little zodiac and boat downstream from there and bouncing off all these in situ stumps. There's all these logs and stumps in this section of the river from old forests from before Bering Lake was there and there were trees growing in that location. And there's weeds growing everywhere and these outburst mega floods rushing downstream. It's a wild place. You also have big changes in meltwater. Um, for example, Upper Bering River here, this was the main stem. When they made the, the names and the maps, very logically, Bering Glacier flowed down Bering River into Bering Lake. And now the three are entirely hydrologically separated. They don't flow together at all <laughs> um, because of the changes in the landscape. And most of the water from Bering Glacier is coming, or on this side of Bering Glacier, is coming down the Gandal River, which I'll show you in a little bit, uh, didn't really exist in its current form as recently as 1979. And it's just kind of a slough part of the way up towards the, the glacier lake, but that's, that's more to come. And then tsunamis. Um, we have had in like 1899 Yakutat earthquakes, the tsunami went all the way up into Bering Lake. Um, so a lot of dynamic factors in the landscape here. But through it all, um, this area has produced, been producing salmon and people have been harvesting them for a long time. You'll find these stone net sinkers all around the Bering Lake area, um, evidence of where people have been, been catching, catching salmon. I should have specified, that was a Will Shrek map, by the way, Teal, who made that one. And he made this one, too. Um, and um, this shows our, uh, our study reaches. We have four reaches of interest for our in-stream flow reservations. We have gauges, so water measuring setups on two of them. Um, the Kushika Outlet Reach, remember this is the old main stem of bearing. Um, let me give you a little bit of reference. So here's 
the stellar gla stellar lobe of the Bering Glacier up on the left side there, the far east side of this image. It's the Acoustica Lake, that's a pro-glacial lake, there's a glacier right here dumping into that um, off the Martin Ice Field. And then you see Lake Charlotte here, this is another pro-glacial lake but much smaller little patch of ice coming into Lake Charlotte. Um, Bering Lake over here has no glacier coverage. Um, and these are kind of the headwaters of our study area. You see this pale yellow polygon, that's the Huck boundary. This is where the water from Bering Glacier used to flow down here, and now it's all flowing down this Gandal River further to the east. And so it's outside of our immediate study reaches. We tried to gauge that, and we just couldn't keep the gauges in because of these outburst events. So where's, where's the open water on Bering Glacier? So that's it right there. So where for the, the outburst floods? Yeah. Those are coming out of Berg Lake, perched right up here. Okay, and then below there, right there. Right below there, yeah, that. These that's, are all lakes. Yeah, those are all lakes. So we, yeah. we landed there in 1974 with the Zodiac, and we motored down the main stream, not, not uh, Gandal. The Through here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's where the river used to flow, is right, right out here. That was in 74. Cool. Me. And, and we never encountered any Elvia at all. Oh, cool. Okay. Yep. Yep. And you would see it. We we see a lot of it here on this half of Bering Lake and yeah. downstream towards this gauge. It's all around this gauge here, which is also downstream from Shepherd Creek coming in. Um, so reach. This is one of our study reaches. This is one of them between upstream from Shepherd and downstream from Bering Lake. Um, the third reach here we call Bering Lake Outlet, which is the main stem of Dick Creek there. And then um, what we call Kushtika Outlet, because it's, it's downstream from Kushtika Lake, but it was the main stem of Bering River. Those are our four study reaches. We have these two gauges, one here on Kushtika and one here on Bering Outlet. Um, it's kind of neat because we have different watershed sizes and different percentages of glacier coverage upstream in these four different sections, and those are the big factors that determine how much water we have. So we have kind of four reaches that we can compare and contrast, so that's scientifically interesting. Um, there are lakes upstream from all of them. Um, these are broad channels. You know, they're going to be you know, 150 to 500 feet wide, um, and, but they're shallow. And then because our, where our gauges are are in that old footprint of the lake, of Bering Lake, um, the, the slopes are very flat still. They're, they're very low grade streams where we're working. And so I, I should back up. Total, that's about 25 miles of stream that we're hoping to apply for in stream reservation time. So how do we get that 175,000 data points? Um, well, it's easy to measure the depth of a stream. We can put in a device to do that continuously every 15 minutes, which is kind of the resolution that we need to satisfy DNR. Um, and then we need to go out there and measure the discharge, which is the amount of the volume of water flowing by in a certain amount of time, typically every second. We need to measure that periodically and then, so that's step two, and then we can relate those two things in what they call a rating curve. This is the easiest way to get at it, uh, where we have depth here on our vertical y-axis and discharge on our x-axis. And in this example, say that the water stage is just elevation. We're turning depth into elevation. And say that that's at 3.3 3 feet. When, we, when Will shows up out there, Will measures a discharge at 40 cubic feet per second. So he tells me that the, the stage was 3.3 and the discharge was 40, and then I plug that into my curve. And then the Will's last trip, he measured here more at four feet, and the discharge was 100, so I plug that into my curve, and I fit this empirically, I make this fit. And then based on this fit, I'll show you that in a second. Um, and once we make this fit, then we can just measure the depth, and based on the depth, I can tell you what the discharge is on any given day. So that's our way of relating these two. And here's, I'll give you some more details on all of these steps. Here's how we measure the depth. We have a pressure, tr pressure measuring device that measures the pressure of the water, and then we can mathematically convert that into depth. And this um, a little guy like this it has a cable so we can download it. They call it sneaker net is the joke. You know, USGS, they would have this telemeter where it goes through satellites and comes back to the office and you can look at it. Will or I needs to go out there and download it with our computer to bring it back to the office. But this keeps all the data on its, in its unit. And we secure it in what they call a stilling well, so just a water pipe with holes in it, just to keep the unit safe from debris and to keep it from moving. 
And here's how those data look. This is a 15 minute um, stage data. And all of a sudden these outburst flood events are hopefully you know, popping up. These are these, these huge spikes where this is the water surface elevation, basically the depth in meters. And this is time. And you know we're getting, typically we have some storms, right? And the water goes up by five or six feet even for a big one. And then we have these other ones where it's going up 9, 12, 13 feet of water level rise during those outburst floods. So again, we'll be talking about that here a little later. In the discharge, so getting at Kim's question, how we do it out there, since we can't wade these channels, is with this little trimaran, orange trimaran boat, that's called an acoustic Doppler current profiler. Basically, it sends a sound beam down to the bottom. And you know how if a fire truck passes you, the siren sounds differently when it's approaching you versus when it's going away? That's because the sound waves are stacking or they're getting more spread out. And this machine uses that same phenomenon <laughs> to determine the speed of the water and the depth of the water. So it's measuring speed and depth and it has a high resolution GPS and it's tracking where it is in the channel. And so that's our whiz bang way of measuring the amount of water coming downstream. Um, and you can see here we drag it back and forth on a little tagline, the least high tech part of the whole operation. We pull it back and forth really slowly. And you can also see some of this Elodia in here and Potomagetan too. And here's a mat of Elodia as an example that's growing in the channel, filling the channel, which obviously messes with our instrument. And it also changes the relationship between depth and, uh, and discharge, which I'll show you in a minute. But we go out there, we, we would aim for 10 a year, but we've, with weather delays and everything else, we've never been able to hit it. But we have you know, roughly um, 12 to 20 measurements at, at our different study reaches over the last few years. Um, we can also get at discharge indirectly. So this is, we did a survey out there with a high resolution GPS. It's all these points that you see. This is an example from, from one of the stream reaches. And um, so we can get the, sh the shape of the channel. And then we installed crest gauges, which are these um, metal pipes. Um, and this is actually up on shore, but this is during a flood, so the water is up onto the bank. And we put this, there's some holes in the bottom of this pipe, and we put this wooden dowel, typically it's in the middle of that pipe, I just have it hanging on the outside for the photo. And we put some cork powder down in there. So when the water comes up, it floats the cork, and it leaves a mark on the dowel inside the pipe and preserves the highest that the water got. So that's what this orange arrow is pointing at, or sorry, yellow arrow, it's pointing at the cork line. And so we know the water was up to there, and so then um, I can, from that, that's important because I can get the slope of the water, which is the last piece that I need mathematically to tell you how much water is flowing down this channel based on its shape, is how, what the water slope was. So we can get our high flow estimates that way and uh, validate our rating curve that way. So it was a useful technique. And here's what you end up with. Let's look at the one on the right. This inset is just a zoom of this. But, um, you see we have our discharge here and our depth basically, you know, gauge height is just depth or elevation on the, uh, on the y-axis. And these plus signs up here with the red line, those are from that survey data from the, the, um, the model the modeling method. And then all these points down here are all different measurements that we've taken. And you can see how we fit the curve to those points. And we had to shift it a little bit. Um, we had to change um, from one year to the next, so we had to shift that. Um, and that's at our gauge below Kushtika Lake. Similarly at Bering, we did the same thing, but you can see the fit is horrible. Well, that's because of all that vegetation effect. So what we have happening here is during the growing season, um, the channel is filling with vegetation, and so we have a higher water level for the same discharge. Mm -hmm. So we have to shift the curve, and so that's about, that orange line is approximately where it's at at peak growing season. And so I've determined that three, three different ways to validate it, independent ways, but that's kind of, we just move it up and down um, with the amount of vegetation growth. And that varies year to year. So the more measurements that we can get out there, the better. Um, so we have two gauges, four reaches. Well, how the heck do we do the other two? Um, we do that through record extension. So um, this photo shows, here's our reach where we have our gauge. This is Shepherd Creek coming in. You can see it here on the map too. Here's Shepherd Creek coming in. Um, and this is the outlet of Bering Lake. And so we have our gauge down here. We also measure discharge above this confluence. And then we relate those two through a linear model. So we just have, you know, we relate one to the other and it's a pretty good fit. 
So we can extend that record and say, okay, well, we know what the discharge is here. We know that this is usually 60% of it, so we just relate that out for 60% of it. And then we can just do simple subtraction. We know what this is, we know what this is, we know how much Shepherd Creek is putting in by subtraction. So that's how we do the other two reaches. What do we see? Um, well, we see that if there's no glacier upstream, you have a very distinct snowmelt peak. This kind of surprised me because we've had such poor snow years up until now. Um, but we still have been seeing, um, you know, we started this study after snowpocalypse. And so, you know, 2016 was really warm, 2019 was really warm, not much snow. But we have this peak late April, early May, um, a decline in the early summer. And then we have our biggest flows in the autumn. And that's also true at the sites with glaciers upstream. We see our biggest flows in August and September associated with big rainstorms, and we also have glacier melt on top of that, so we have even more water. But what's interesting here is our snow melt signature blends right into our midsummer glacier melt. So we have more water flowing in the summer down those glacier systems. And then how do we get at this idea of a minimum flow? That's what we need for our reservation, right? Is how much water do the fish need? So we're doing what Fish and Game does, and which is they are finding the 65th percentile. So what do I mean by that? Well, so in this example, well, we divide up the whole our time period. We, we're just doing this when there's no ice on the river. So from April 15th to early November. We divide that up into six periods, roughly a month long. Here is an example of one of those months, which is June. Take all our June data from all our years, and this is at the Kushtika site. 0% time exceedance, this will be our highest flow that we recorded, so we rank them all. So 5,600 is our highest flow. Our lowest flow is one, about 1,100 in CFS. So we just rank them all in between, and then we divide them up into these bins, and we find that 65th percentile. And so that's less than the median flow, less than the mean. It ends up being, on average, about um, this flow is exceeded 20 days of June out of 30 days, say, on average, typical June. So the flow that we're requesting is kind of, you know, is, is would be in effect 10 days out of an average month. And so that's how we're getting at that. And we do that for all these six time periods for each of the four different sites. And those so are the is numbers. Is that defined by DNR, the 66%? No, you can mm -hmm. choose a method of your choosing. Oh, okay. It could be a biologically based, habitat based. Um, mm -hmm. And then, but this is what Fish and Game does. And they're kind of the leaders, and they have more of these water reservations than anyone. And since this is our first time going through this, we're just yeah. sticking with their playbook. For, for fish use? For fish use, okay. yeah. <coughs> um, so yeah, oh look, there's Will walking upstream. It's amazing how shallow you get in some sections here. And these are all coho salmon that the school and we were kicking out with our feet as we're dragging our boat back up to Bering Lake. Um, and so with that shallow water, you know, we do, we do need a minimum flow, really, or else you go dry pretty quick. Um, our applications are, are fully complete. They're at the, in Anchorage for review, and then hopefully they'll be submitted here any day now uh, to the DNR. We'll still keep collecting data for at least one more summer. If they want more data, we'll, we'll ho hopefully be able to keep collecting it, but we're, fingers crossed, we'll be done after one more year. As those data come in, I'll keep updating everything, and I'll put together a report that just compares the flows. So if anyone's interested, just send me an email, and I can uh, put you on the list and send it to you when it's out. Okay, these mega floods. This is the fun part of the talk. Hopefully your backs are doing okay. We're good on time. Um, here's a photo from the airplane. This shows Bering Lake here in the foreground, but when it's inundated by this flood. Pretty cool. Note how this flood basically, remember that yellow polygon of the old Bering Lake before the earthquake? It basically refills it, because that's the lowest ground around. Um, you see, this is where Berg Lake, this is where this water is coming from, perched up there on the glacier. This hillside right here is about 550 feet above sea level, and the lake is up kind of behind that hill for now. Um, here's how the lake looks when it's dry. So what happens is it fills with water, and it releases all that water, and then you're just left with all these monster house-sized icebergs resting on a dry lake bed. Um, and for extra trivia, point, you see where our stream gauges are, they get inundated. And fortunately, they get kind of ponded over, so they don't get, there's not a lot of shear stress on them, you know, knocking them over. They do catch a little bit of debris as the water is falling, but they're not taking the brunt of this, um, and so they survive these events reasonably well. 
But yeah, trivia word is yokaloop. That's an Icelandic term for these events. And it's also the international standard. This is what they call them all around the world, is yokaloops, um, which is a fun word. And they know a lot about these in Iceland because they have a lot of geothermal activity along with glaciers. And so they have a lot of melt from geothermal activity underneath the ice. And that can, can cause these events. Okay, so um, up until 2013, this is, so here's Bird Lake, and this is this outlet gorge. Uh, this blue arrow represents the outlet gorge. And so right about the, the end of that arrow, that's here, looking downstream. So this is the lake, and there's this gorge. And here's further downstream looking upstream. So the lake's up here, and you can see this is a spectacular um, carved gorge. And this is not during an event. This is just day-to-day -day flows. Think of it like your bathtub. Water comes up, it goes out the overflow drain. That's what this is. This is the overflow drain of your bathtub. And water's flowing out this bedrock gorge all the time and preventing it from building up so much water that it releases catastrophically. So that's just typically its state. And then every now and then, um, like we're talking decades in between some of the events, um, this glacier would advance where these yellow arrows are, this lobe of the glacier, and would block that gorge. And then that's like putting a sock in your bathtub, you know, overflow. So the water keeps coming up. Now my analogy breaks down because somehow your sock has to float out. And then all the water has to drain out the bottom of your tub, right? Because what happens is this, then this ice blocks the water, it backs up. Then the ice floats and all the water comes rushing out. And so that makes this big flood event. And um, Post and Mayo are two glaciologists who you know, worked all over the state of Alaska. And, um, Dave Janka can probably tell you all sorts of stories about them. This is Austin Post and Larry Mayo. Yeah, yeah. And Pete can tell you all sorts of stories about them. <laughs> and um, in 1971, they had never seen a flood out of Berg Lake because it hadn't happened for at least 40 years. But they, based on the geometry, determined that it could, it had one of the greatest floods of any lake in Alaska and it could, the flow could far exceed 1 million CFS. I don't know how they, pick that thing. This just sounded really good to say far exceeds one million. But a big flood could come out of this sucker. And it started happening uh, in the 80s. So this is after um, Pete's raft trip. He probably remembers these events. So there's three in a row. There's also a historical record from the late 1800s from two geologists that came through. Um, and then certainly an event in 94. And if anyone knows of any others, please let me know the month and the year. And we want to look it up in the satellite record. Um, but this is when that glacier advanced. Here, here is from 86. You can see how far advanced this lobe of the glacier is. This is after a release. You can see the effects of the inundation out here in that yellow polygon. Um, interestingly, I was just talking with Ron Goodrich about the 82 event. And that one released underneath the glacier itself, which will, will be a kind of a segue to our next slide. But the 86 one definitely released down this gorge. And that's what you see pictured here. This is mid-flood the water raging out of that lake. And it inundates this whole valley. You know, it's about 10 times, the inundation zone's about 10 times the size of the Yak Lake. And, you know, cottonwoods underwater, it's up, it gets up pretty high. Um, also, interestingly, the Gandal River, here's, this shows the lake, here's the glacier, right, Stellar Glacier, this is that big lake at the bottom. Pete floated out here and down Upper Bering River. That's where all the water was going in 79. Um, look at 86, this Gandal River is connected through here, head cut all the way back up through. And now, today, in that 2019, not a single drop of water went out this outlet at all, even during outburst flood, it all went down to Gandal. So major river changing events, and that's why folks like Kim can get their bow pickers up that sucker, because <laughs> it's down cutting so rapidly, it's still very deep. And so you can, you can get a surprisingly big boat up into the Starro Dubsoft Lake. Um, Austin Post, I think, named all these after the crew of Vitus Bering's ships. So it's like Ivanov and Starro Dubsoft and all these Russian names. Um, except for one that I'll show it to you in a minute. Um, and so here's, how, here's a zoom in of our gauge record during these events. Here's that water depth, basically, for each event. Each one of these is a different event throughout our study and it was captured at one or both of our gauges. You can see in events five and six where both gauges captured it, that the peak is basically the same, indicating that we are ponded over both gauges. There's a flat surface over both structures. Um, 
And, but yeah, what the heck, you know, this thing goes like six times in a hundred years, and then we start working out there, and it goes seven times in six years, what <laughs> gives with that? Um, and we see that these events, you know, they're, start, they're uh, pretty steep rises and falls. This isn't like a tsunami coming downstream, but it's rising fast enough that if you're a deep sleeper and you sleep for 12 hours, you want to be paying attention before you went to bed at night, because you'd be flooded out at some point. You know, it's coming up a few feet in six hours. Um, these release last three to six days, um, but the inundation can really linger for like a month and a half and varying like it stays turbid for a long time downstream. Um, and yeah, like I said, well, Bird Lake is about two and a half times the, the surface area of Eag Lake, we're much deeper, and the inundation zone is about 100 square kilometers, so yeah, about 10 times Eag Lake. The other neat thing here, so this is 2013, remember that water flowing out of the bathtub? It has been totally dry 365 days of the year since 2014. So why the heck is that? And why are we having all these floods? Well, enter the US Geological Survey. They can answer this for you. They've been looking at this. Bruce Volnia is another famous um, glaciologist along with like Austin Post. You know, he worked in Bering Glacier for a long time. Um, Kim Angeli and Sean Dills are, are remote sensing guys. And they work in Reston, Virginia. And they've been looking at these images on their computer Unfortunately, the weather service in Anchorage knew that I was gauging and they put us in touch and so we've had a lot of fun kind of piecing all this together. But they could figure all this out from Virginia. Um, <laughs> that what's happening is that this glacier has thinned 400 feet since 1948 in the terminus. So that's the same height if you were to walk from the harbor up to the base of the ski hill. That's 400 feet. That's how much ice we've lost in 70 years. And as a result, the glacier is now at its fighting weight. It's light and mobile. And so as the water rises, the glacier floats, and all this water rushes out underneath the glacier. And it goes eight kilometers, or it was, between 2014 and 2018, it was going eight kilometers underneath the glacier and dumping out into Lake Ivanov, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and these are big events. We're dropping you know, 325 feet of water each time, so that's why we're having such a big flood. <coughs> You know what they would pay for that water in Oregon or California? <laughs> That's what Steve's thinking. <laughs> um, and um, so a whole different mechanism. And as this glacier receded, our bathtub overflow drain is dry. That bedrock sill of the gorge is just floating above high and dry because the glacier is now lower and the water is lower. It never reaches it. It never gets high enough to spill over and down that gorge. And it won't again unless there's a major change in the glacier. Oh yeah, um, each time this happens, um, 50 to 100 meters of ice calves off this face. Mm. So that's where we're getting all these bergs. So it's also eating away the terminus of that glacier. It's kind of a corrosive effect on the, because when it floats, <laughs> they just break apart. Oh, here's Kim's boat. So here's, this is why Kim is here. There she is, I'm giving away her secret moose hunting spot. <laughs> but that's, that's for scale. Look at the size of these. These are like miles away in the distance. Look at the size of that iceberg. <laughs> so, same thing. all the way up to that face of the glacier. Yeah, so impressive. Do you have any guesses on how big that is? Like, compared to the Cordova Center? It wasn't Center? flooding like that. It wasn't flooding like that at the time? Okay. Yeah, so, so same thing. This lake level rises. So this is here. This is in Lake Ivanov, right? You see these chunks right here? That's where they're breaking off. So that water is coming out of Berg Lake. This whole glacial terminus is floating. And it's flowing under, getting into all the drainage. You know, there's conduits and big caverns under the glacier. And it's draining under there and dumping out over here. And that's what you're seeing right here. There's that outlet. And as that water level rises, it's breaking apart the glacier here. And then as it's flooding out, it's breaking apart the glacier there. Um, and this is what was happening until 2018. 2019, it's changed yet again. So Pac-Man Lake, you can tell that Sean Dills named this one based on its shape. He was a little younger, he would have called it SpongeBob SquarePants Lake, but it's Pac-Man Lake. <laughs> and that would be the most direct line of water. And this is what Ron told me in 82, this is where it was releasing, because this was blocked off and water was flowing out under here. And that's happening again in 2019. Uh, oh, well, I'll show you that in one minute. First, here's how much bearings changed. So this is 1905, you can see it was five different lakes. Um, very similar in the, the four, late 40s, up here. Um, the Berg Lakes, or actually they had Berg Lake by then, I think they called them the Berg Lakes with a plural. We had one lake by 77, um, 
and those events in the 80s were arguably the biggest because the glacier was still pretty tall. Now here's how it looked in 2019. So um, pretty, still a pretty sizable lake, although the 400 feet of glacier loss, it's hard to make up for that amount of water. And then here's 2019. So this is what I was alluding to here, this photo in the middle. So the water, instead of coming out here, it was coming out here. So it was taking the shortest path down along the edge of that hillside. And that's significant because it opened up some 1,300 foot long cracks in the surface here all the way down and indicating that there was an ice tunnel that collapsed. And so that ultimately, if um, this continued, what we would anticipate likely happening uh, nothing certain with these glaciers. But what likely would happen is that we will either form a surface water connection here, um, or you know, as a glacier thins, um, or we'll have a subterranean um, connect. You know, a glacier uh, subterranean, I should say, um, underneath the ice connection that will connect Berg Lake to this lake all the time, to Pac-Man all the time. And eventually, this is probably likely how it'll look, where it'll all be one big lake. And you know, this sill, bedrock sill, is 550 feet above sea level. I was meaning to check the elevation here. Let's assume it's about 50 feet. So 500 feet, you know, we lost 400 feet of ice in 70 years. You know, we do that again. This all of a sudden is looking pretty plausible. And then your bedrock gorge is just perched up there 500 feet in the air. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it likely has happened in the past because um, there are Dolly Varden in this lake. And in the streams, upriver from it, little dwarf Dolly Varden. So how do they get there? I mean, there's a chance that maybe like a, a eagle dropped them, but it, most likely we had this scenario in the past and they just swam in there and then they got trapped when the glacier advanced. And so that would be the other um, alternative would be the glacier could surge or advance and we could go back to the way that it was in 2013 or 2080, but at the rate of loss at this glacier and other glaciers, it doesn't seem too likely. Most likely we'll We'll end up more in a scenario like this in 100 years or who knows how long it will be. I'll have to ask, uh, ask those Sean and Bruce. So thank you for coming out, your attention. Yeah, this is our new daughter, Callie, and our, our, her first king, Sam. <laughs> yeah. And if you guys have any questions, I'll try to answer them. From my observations, with the caveat that that's also where we spend the most time, because we're on our way out. But yeah, I think that aligns with what Elizabeth found on her surveys. I'm looking at Will just to mm -hmm. corroborate. And there's a lot of it in the river, which is interesting. Really? Um, um, downstream from there. What about uh, the Port of Aguin? That's where the trout are swimming super deep. Yep, yep. It's growing right up through the Elodia, and that's really what gives our outwards the most trouble. Because when the lake starts falling, it's rafted onto the surface. Right. But the Port of Aguin should be through the whole lake. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's more widely distributed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Were you part of the swan study out there at all, or? No, but I mean that's where swans will winter when the lake's not frozen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. where food is. Yes. I don't have a question, but just a just a comment in your introduction about the ice worms. Yes. I think it was uh, 2012 was the big snow. Uh huh. And I was able to see Wolverine up until the birds and shut me down, which is probably late April or early May. And that falls before you get to the ridge, I found a patch of little worms. <laughs> and it was such a bright sunny day, um, they were totally desiccated. <coughs> I tried to take a picture with my digital camera, but looking at the screen <clears throat> on a bright sunny day, you can't see anything. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the photograph didn't turn out. But there must have been at least Hmm. Cool. But there were ice worms? Or just well, I, don't know, I don't know if there were actual ice worms, but there were little, little skinny worms. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, Besides yeah. the black thread that you sew with? Um, I think they might have been a little thicker than that. Yeah, they probably weren't ice worms. So I have been hearing about some other black worms that people see on the surface of the snow um, around here as well. So if you see one, grab one, bring it in, and we'll let you know if it's an ice worm. And then the other interesting thing about that story, though, Bob, 
is that their scientific name for ice worms are, is basically translate to sun avoider because the same thing would happen to ice worms if they have to avoid the sunlight or else they will, um, you know, I don't know, like melt away or do whatever they do. Okay. Anything else? Any questions for Will? <laughs> no, I don't have any questions for you. On your original um, <laughs> like site map or the map of the area, do you have a sense of where the property boundaries would be or where the you know the carbon mountain line would be? Yeah, well, I, um, I'll show you roughly where that ridge line is. So I believe that it's this Carbon Creek area and this ridge line here is where there was formerly activity in the turn of the century, in the 20th century. Um, I know that Chugach Alaska Corp recently sold a whole bunch of carbon for carbon credits to utilities in California, something to that effect, locking up that carbon for good. Um, I believe that there's still another inholding there held by a different mining company, but um, I haven't heard any talk of any sort of activity proposed up there. But yeah, this whole area on here likely has a lot of coal um, in it still. Um, so if you can't mine coal economically in West Virginia, I don't know how you're going to do it in the Bering, but things change over time. So it could be valuable someday. And I think that's an important point that our water reservation doesn't preclude any sort of future development or anything. It's just saying we need this minimum water flow for salmon. And beyond that, you can use whatever water you want and do whatever you can get permitted through other permit processes. There's nothing restrictive about development here at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In Bering Lake, do you notice that it has a lot of methane coming out of it? Because I heard it has like a methane event or something. Oh, huh, I'd be really interested to hear more about that. Like um, it certainly has that look, right? And because it was formerly intertidal, and there's just a lot of PD deposition there, I could certainly see how it could be producing a, a bunch of methane. Yeah. Kitchener Cove, like, um, that had a lot of methane. Oh, hmm. oh interesting. Okay. They, that, they said they have, that has ghosts in it. There's yeah, yeah, that's there's where the bubble is, where the name comes from. Cool. That's cool history. Great. We were there for this big outflow event, and it was huge. I mean, everything that we had been dry was no longer dry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hydraulic events. Oh, that. That was yeah, cool. You can get to see where we are. <laughs> so here was the your flood, Kim. Where's my my flood? <laughs> so I think that was in uh, 2018. Yeah. Well, and plus it makes oh, sense that it's a, that not as steep a flood as what you were talking about because we watched the water rise for yeah a, a week plus. Yeah. I mean, every day it rose a foot. Yeah, oh, and I should say this, well, yeah, it releases three to six days, but the lingering effect's going to be much longer downstream, right? So, yeah, exactly. You're going to see it downstream for a while. Uh -huh. With the, seeing these outburst floods, what do you know about the Kennecott Glacier flood event that happens almost every year? Mm -hmm. Every yep. spring, it gets mixed into the big water level um, measuring on the copper, but is it a different type of yeah, no, you're exactly right. Yeah, I should have added that these events happen statewide on various systems. There's one up there by Kennecott. Um, Van Cleve Lake, which is right by Miles Glacier, does this every other year, every year. And Snow River on the Kenai, you know, I think is on every other year cycle. And some of these are, are super reliable. Think of it kind of like geysers in Yellowstone. Some of them are very predictable. They release every year. And why that is is because the glacier is staying relatively the same thickness and it takes relatively the same amount of water, meltwater, to float the glacier and cause the flood. So whether that's a two-year amount of meltwater or a one-year amount of meltwater, that's kind of what what's it takes to float the glacier and cause that release. So yeah, very similar mechanism. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, but it sounds like, but here with the tidal influence and breaking off the corrosive effect that you described on these, 
mm -hmm. glaciers? Is it a little more accelerated or is it different than there? Yeah, it is glaciers thinning rapidly, and that might be the case on some of these others where you might, it might have been every three years before and now it's every year. Certainly that sort of thing is likely if, if the glacier is thinning. But remember, whether the glacier is thinning is a combination of how fast it's melting at the bottom and how fast it's growing at the top. It's like an escalator of ice coming down the mountain. And so there can be multiple factors there. And so depending on the geometry of the glacier, you could have a fairly reliable cycle for many, many decades or longer where the glacier is staying a relatively similar thickness or it's not thinning enough to make a difference as far as the amount of weight that it takes to lift. Mm -hmm. the and is that also known as the rebound effect? I mean, in the sea level rise yeah. conversation. Yeah, yeah, so that's isostatic effect. rebound. So the way to think about that is, right, so the Earth's crust is floating in magma, or, you know, think about like a two by four floating in the harbor. And if you have a bunch of seagulls standing on the two by four, it's gonna float, sink lower. And if all those seagulls fly away, it's going to come up a little. That's the rebound effect of isostatic rebound, so that the cr Earth's crust is doing that in the magma. The, the weight of the glaciers is flying away, and so the whole crust is floating up and rising. Um, and here, I've been asked if that might affect this elevation of this sill, um, but it's happening underneath the glacier and at the sill at the same rate. So the geologists assure me that, no, it's probably here, it's just that the ice is thinning. Uh, but and interestingly, um, southeast is rebounding very rapidly, and it would far outpace any sort of sea level change. The way that the crust is folded on the Copper River Delta in particular, we're having net subsidence of like five to seven millimeters a year. So the Copper River Delta is sinking, regardless of any sort of isostatic rebounding from loss of glaciers. So our immediate landscape here is subsiding at the crustal level crust is sinking, which is unique in coastal Alaska because most of it is rising as the glaciers melt and that weight is taken off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, in northern Prince James Island, the Columbia Basin, mm -hmm. that's what I was yep. where that, that is. That definitely is, definitely there you have up, yep, you have, um, beyond any sea level. exactly, you have strong isostatic rebound there. Mm -hmm. It just has to do with how the crust is folded right here mm -hmm. on the delta. And it doesn't hurt probably that you're dumping on 100 million tons of sand every single year coming down the river. But it's, it's regardless of that, it's not that that sand is settling out, it's that the crust is actually sinking here on the delta, um, which is unique. Great. Well, yeah, thank you all. Oh, and we're doing an open house on, associated with ice worm after the parade. So if you have other questions, feel free to come and bother me there.